At the store where I worked many years ago, among the busiest times of the year were Halloween, San Diego Pride, and Christmas. For eight years, I was a floor clerk at the crypt on the corner of Park and University and Hillcrest. Oh, you heard of it. <laughs> Did you know we had seven locations across three states, all of which closed in 2015 due to new owners and poor management? So if you're not familiar, the crypt was what I described as an adult boutique. Some called it a dirty bookstore. Uh, that was our North Park location. <laughs> Ours was a classy place. In the large front room, we sold stylish club clothing, fashionable shoes, boots, designer underwear, lingerie, and leather. In the back room is where we had all the fun stuff that you could strap on, caress, inflate, flog, or insert. Our clientele were people ranging from suit-wearing city lawyers to hippies of all ages coming into shop or browse or to seek advice as to how to fulfill a fantasy. But what I liked most was making the nervous customer feel comfortable. To get them to tell me exactly what it was that they were looking for, I had a way of earning their trust <laughs> so I could get them to open up and let me take a peek into their most dark and personal fantasies. <laughs> Helping men figure out their cock ring size was one way to stay in touch with the community. <laughs> but I always, always kept it clean and professional. And we had all kinds of unique Christmas gifts, ideas, including the Christmas tree-shaped butt plug that you could stuff in your loved one's stocking. <laughs> in contrast, Christmas mornings at mom and dad's home in Paradise Hills were less erotic, erotic simply because uh, it was just Bob, Terry, and myself. Now, my mom wanted a large family, but I was the only surviving child of nine miscarriages. And Christmas was my mom's favorite holiday, and she was really the one who put all her heart and effort into making each Christmas special for both my dad and myself. So every Christmas morning growing up and when I stayed over, mom would wake us up with chiming, Merry Christmas, come see what Santa Claus bought you, Santa was here. It's like, Mom, I'm 43. <laughs> then she made coffee. We'd spend the morning opening gifts while listening to Nat King Cole's Christmas album. For breakfast, she made scrambled eggs and sausages and those Pillsbury rolls with the melted orange icing. Dad would go watch golf. Mom would busy herself preparing a five-course meal for guests that they always had over in the evening. And I sometimes had to go to work, which I didn't mind. But Christmas of 2010 was going to be the first one without mom, who died from brain cancer earlier that year, leaving just dad and myself. Now, my dad was ex-Navy, and God forbid should you pay him any disrespect. His responsibility in my upbringing was to provide the basics, and for much of my early life, I felt intimidated by him, and we weren't exactly chummy. He didn't know how to be emotionally available, nor did my mom actually, but there was no recognition of my special needs nor support for my natural talents, which were always met with some criticism, never an attaboy, resulting in self-esteem becoming my crippling shortcoming. But just before Christmas uh, that year, I thought it would be a nice gesture to spend a month staying over at his house, so I did, because I didn't want him to feel alone for the holidays. And I saw an opportunity to bury any ill feelings and start a new bonding venture for our new relationship now with mom gone. He was 78 years old and alone in this big house. And outside of seeing his buddies on the golf course, he really didn't have much of a social life. And without mom, I had no idea as to what to give my dad for Christmas presents. On the meager wish list that he gave me were Titleist golf balls and a gray sweatshirt. So back at the crypt. <laughs> it was, was the night before Christmas Eve of 2010, and my coworker Raj and I were putting together these gift baskets of adult toy accessories. And we were kidding around about how funny it would be to give and surprise my serious dad by giving him one of these as a joke. 
as he told me that he recently browsed a single site or two. And I told Roger that such a gift might spark up dad's social life and maybe nudge him into messaging back the woman who sent a photo of herself climbing out of a swimming pool wet in her purple one piece with a white piping, her floaties and rubber floral bathing cap. I really wasn't going to follow through with it as much as I loved envisioning dad opening a trick peanut can full of spring-loaded penises. But to him, not so funny. Around 10 p.m., the store phone rings, and it's my dad. And I said, Dad, we were just talking about... And he interrupted in a shaky voice. Son, are you, are you busy? Is there a way you can come home right now? I, I, I don't feel right. I don't know if I'm, I'm having a heart attack or a stroke. I felt sudden panic as if a bomb exploded, leaving me trapped in a burning room. I'm coming home right now. I I'm calling on one. Don't try to get up or go downstairs. Shit. I bolted out of the store, abandoning Roger, got into my little blue PT cruiser, and took off to the house. On the way, I called 911 and Dad's next-door neighbors. And when I called Dad back, there was no answer. Luckily, the freeway was clear, and I had my windows rolled down because my head was swimming. And the cold wind rushing in just kind of soothed my nerves. And then I began remembering all the things that Dad had done for me. He bought me my first car in high school. He let me live under his roof rent-free well into my 20s and whenever I had to go back for between places. And slipped me a few bucks just because. Though it seemed like an hour, it took only 15 minutes to get to the house. The paramedics and his neighbors were there, and Dad was in his recliner, conscious. I watched as they hooked him up to all this monitoring equipment, and then they brought my dad to the ambulance and off to a Chula Vista hospital. They went with me in hot pursuit. I was amazed at how suddenly life's plans can change. To celebrate 10 years of living in my North Park apartment, I was looking forward to moving back and repainting and redecorating after the happy new year, but then I was thinking I'd probably have to move out, take care of him, quit work, cancel my road trip, and take care of all of dad's business affairs. And then I began to feel sort of selfish about thinking that way, and I was like, well, no. I mean, I was just making a mental list of all the things I was simply gonna have to do for the worst case scenario. I arrive at the hospital, dad's already been taken somewhere to be poked and prodded, which was ironic because I could have been in the gift basket that I was going to give him. <laughs> they ruled out two major things. He wasn't having a stroke nor a heart attack, so that was a relief. And uh, they were going to keep him overnight for observation and to wait the results of other tests. While still waiting for his room to be ready at 3 in the morning, I was assured that all was fine and that I could go home. So I left my dad lying on the bed staring up at the white tiled ceiling, his eyes pink and watery, and I'd never seen him cry before, even when mom died, you know, his wife of 56 years. Now it's Christmas Eve, she's gone, and he's come face to face with his own mortality. After a sleepless night in the same room I slept in growing up, I called in the morning to check on dad, and he told me that he was still feeling a little spooked, but better. I went to the hospital and I walked into his room and he was in his bed and his next door neighbors were there and they even brought him flowers. Later in the day, as his face was striped with the afternoon sun shining through the vertical blinds and enjoying his IV drip, dad started to recount to us the series of events from the night before. He had eaten dinner, had dessert, enjoyed a cocktail. Later on, he was in his recliner watching television when he started to feel like he was melting. He mentioned something about not being able to lift his arms when he raised them at the same time having this feeling of being mildly electrocuted. The next door neighbor suggested that, well, it sounds like you had an attack of the anxieties. <laughs> an intense shock of relief hit me like a big bolt of lightning as if I had suddenly discovered an escape out of that burning room I crossed my fingers and I asked, Dad, that dessert. <laughs> Did you by any chance eat me eat a funny tasting brownie that I had stashed way, way, way in the back of the freezer? 
No. But I had a cookie from the refrigerator, though. <laughs> yeah, not quite the right answer. Then he said, I took one bite, and then I gobbled the whole thing down, because it was good. <laughs> Houston, we have isolated the problem. <laughs> I sat by his side with a dropped jaw, as he remembered when, some years ago, he had shared a joint with a buddy on the golf course and have a milder side effect. Didn't care much for it, he said. It handed me a bummer. <laughs> Still not 100% convinced that that's what happened. I was anxious to get home and confirm my suspicion. When I got there, the first thing I did was check the kitchen trash, and sure enough, right on top was the clear, crinkly cellophane wrapper with a cannabis warning label in plain view. <laughs> I called him immediately. He said, uh, you owe me $10. <laughs> oh, Christmas treat. <laughs> After a better night's sleep, I wake up and it's Christmas. And on a crisp, clear morning, I drove through the silent, deserted streets. Past houses where other families were inside, ripping open their presents. Kids playing with their new toys. Adults looking for batteries to put in their vibrator. I'm hoping dad would be released, but I'm also worried the police were gonna be waiting to arrest me for elder abuse. <laughs> About 11 a.m., this handsome doctor came in wearing the white coat with his clipboard book. Mr. Vo, he says, perplexed, stroking his beard. We can't find anything wrong with you, so we just want to run a couple more tests, to which we stopped him and told him about the after-dinner delicacy. He glared at me then darted his eyes at dad and then me again as if we just totally wasted his time. He's like, are you kidding me? <laughs> okay then, let's see if we can get you out of here by noon. So on the way home, we stopped for breakfast at Denny's where I ate scrambled eggs and sausages. Dad polished off two grand slams, my hash browns and half a pecan pie. <laughs> At home, we opened gifts while we had coffee and the Pillsbury Rolls with the melted orange icing. As I watched Dad enthusiastically try on his new gray sweatshirt, I was amazed that he took this whole thing in stride. In contrast to a time decades earlier, there was no damaging consequential impact on my ego for putting him in the hospital on Christmas. <laughs> Were Mom alive, I'm sure it would have been a different story. And I suggested to dad that what happened actually prevented us from having to suffer the sadness of a Christmas morning absent of mom's cheery wake-up call. And he agreed. Oddly, the experience bonded us closer together and that was another great unexpected gift for the both of us. A few years later, he started dating one of my mom's best friends who would become his second wife. For Christmas one year, I slipped into his stocking a blister pack of herbal Viagras that we sold at the crypt. <laughs> and before long, he was asking me if I would add them to his monthly delivery of medicinal gummies. Timothy Bow, everyone. Timothy Bow.